building uh, business, he he came to journalism to try to invest in the kind of journalism that he had seen firsthand as a young man. And so he created the Lippmann Center and the professorship here at the J School. And uh, we always like to remember his vision and his generosity at these events. Um, Jelani got to know him very well along with myself and uh, he, he passed, uh, I guess, a little more than a year ago um, and his sons uh, remain involved with the school. I don't know if they're with us here tonight, but um, we uh, really appreciate the whole family's commitment to journalism of the kind that we're going to talk about today. Uh, the center um, has the uh, resources to support extraordinary journalism by um, professional reporters and writers around the United States and abroad. Under Jelani's direction, it's uh, supported incredible work. And that's what brings us together tonight is to hear from some of the fellows of the center who are doing uh, work that really in, in, in all likelihood would be difficult to do without the kind of support and the grant making uh, and the vision that, that the center brings. Uh, so very proud to be associated uh, with, with uh, the center and Jelani's leadership and also with the Lippmann family. And I look forward to listening to uh, the kind of updates that we, that we try to do as, a, as an opportunity for students to learn about what this work feels like on the ground, and we hope inspire you to do it yourselves uh, as you come out of the J School. So with that, let me uh, turn it over to Professor Jelani Cobb, who I think is also well known to many of you, and he can introduce the panelists. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, and, you know, we, of course, would be remiss to say that the Lippmann Center, the, the J School in general, but the Lippmann Center, of course, in particular, uh, has benefited from your leadership as well uh, in your time here and your support for the work that we've been uh, trying to do as uh, a kind of embryonic uh, center here. I think we are we still the youngest of the centers, you know, at the J School? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're about to be, you're about to have a younger sibling. So please treat, treat her well. I oh, think. okay. Well, you know, <laughs> that will come with, um, you know, all the kind of sibling rivalry stuff that, come with, that it does. Um, so, you know, we're very fortunate uh, to have, you know, three of our fellows here with us today for this discussion. And uh, I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, we want to, oh, before we get uh, too far into this, I should say that if you have questions, and we certainly hope that you do, you can use the Q&A function uh, to enter them. We're going to set aside some time uh, at the end of this conversation uh, to, uh, to deal with the questions that uh, will certainly have arisen uh, in the course of the discussion. Uh, and so uh, uh, with that, I will introduce our panel and we'll, we will get started. Uh, Kovie Biakalo is a journalist and writer specializing in culture and identity. I guess as I say these things, uh, you can wave your hand so you know, the people, I guess so everyone can see you know, on your, your Zoom. All right, well, there it is. Uh, her work has been featured in The Atlantic, uh, the BBC, the New York Times, Smithsonian Magazine, Essence Magazine, and elsewhere. Uh, and it includes critical analyses of race, nationality, and pop culture, among other subjects. Currently, she is a freelance writer focused on reporting, culture commentary, and narrative essays. She has a book contract with Amistad for her debut work, Four Mothers, 500 Years of Heroines from the African Diaspora. Her fellowship work is on the Black immigrants, quote unquote, trail of tears. Uh, our other fellow, our next fellow, uh, Brittany Martin, is a journalist based in Houston. She has spent the last year writing about COVID-19 and its impact on Texans. An experienced investigative reporter, researcher, and long-form narrative writer, her work has appeared in the Washington Post, Texas Monthly, The Daily Beast, Cosmopolitan, Christianity, and Christianity Today. The imprint, oh, the imprint and other publications. She spent five years as a staff writer at regional daily newspapers in Texas, first covering politics and policy for the Dallas Morning News, and then health for the San, Fran San Antonio Express News. She was a member of the Dallas Morning News staff uh, named 2017 Pulitzer Prize finalist in breaking news reporting for her coverage of a mass shooting that left five police officers dead. I think we all remember uh, that moment in that story. Uh, her magazine writing has focused on the long-term effects of trauma following man-made and natural disasters. And her fellowship work is a podcast 
on the former Texas penitentiary called Sugarland and convict leasing. And uh, finally, we have Shema Bayram, who is a Report for America fellow at the Akron Beacon Journal in Akron, Ohio, where she covers Black and minority communities. She's covered a range of social justice issues in Ohio from violence against the LBG, LGBTQ communities and gun legislation to ongoing civil rights protests in the 2020 general election. Previously, she covered criminal justice and local government for the Jackson Free Press in Jackson, Mississippi. Her reporting on Mississippi's sentencing laws and efforts to prevent the state from demolishing a Jackson landmark earned her two first place awards from the Associated Press and a Green Eyeshade Award from the Society of Professional Journalists. She is looking into discriminatory urban planning practices in Akron, Ohio. Um, and so we have a really distinguished group with us uh, and a really impressive group with us uh, this evening. Uh, and so I will start with just the most basic question, which is, uh, I guess, going in the same order of introduction, if you all could talk about the projects that you were working on uh, as Lipman Fellows and how you came to those projects. Hi, uh, I guess I will start. Um, I had initially actually sent out an email. I was looking through my emails pretty recently in anticipation of this question. Um, and I realized I had sent out an email to a couple of um, immigrant um, network contacts because I'd written about immigration um, last year. I'd written two significant stories last year. And I really wanted to focus on a long-term big story. And I had remembered in one of my conversations last year uh, that I wrote for Yes Magazine, which was looking at a history of black migrants and black immigrants into the United States. I had talked with um, the, I would say she's the chief director of BAJI, which is the Black Alliance Justice for Just Immigration. And she had told me about um, an incident of currently or continuously seeing black migrants coming through Tijuana, coming through different parts of the Southern border. And even as someone who pays a lot of attention to immigration news, I had realized very much that there really was not a lot of national spotlight on what was happening. So I'd sent out a bunch of emails in early February to see who can put me in touch with something, anything, anybody that they know who would sort of come through the southern border um, in that way, because in our minds, we sort of uh, have this imagination when we do talk about immigration, we don't really talk about black people very much. And when we do talk about black immigrants, we sort of have this, um, be Nigerian, I can say this, we sort of have this like dominant conversation about sort of middle-class black immigrants who may overstay their visa sometimes if they're undocumented. But in general, there is no huge consensus on who black migrants are and especially poor black migrants. So the story sort of fell in my lap a little bit if I'm being quite honest. And of course you have to do your reporting. But after speaking with um, some folks at Haitian Bridge Alliance in February, they had told me about a Cameroonian woman who what they were recently in touch with who had come through the Southern border the year before. And they wanted me to get in touch with her because they sort of felt like her story was particularly interesting. And being um, from the same region as her, they sort of thought that I would be a good conduit to sort of let the world know about what is happening. And given that Cameroonians in particular um, are very sort of small population of migrants in the United States, whereas there is a lot going on in terms of the Cameroonian Amazonian conflict, the story sort of satisfied my desire to both write about black migrants as well as put a spotlight in particular on um, Cameroon. And then sort of when you're writing about the legacy of black migrants in the United States, you have to talk about Haitians, Haitians as a population. And because Haitians have a very specific history in the United States since the revolution, what ended up happening is I ended up having this sort of brilliant story that married together um, the legacy of enslavement and colonization in the Caribbean, as well as in West Africa, and the racism and how that meets 
in the United States. Mm. So can you talk a little bit about this mechanism? Because when, when we first saw your proposal, um, you know, this was kind of striking you know, to the extent that I was not aware um, of this dynamic myself. Uh, and, you know, subsequent to that, you know, almost uh, in concert, you know, we heard about uh, the, the, um, the crisis uh, of Haitian uh, immigrants um, at the border. Uh, and so can you talk a little bit about the mechanisms of how someone uh, winds up in Cameroon? Because we're, we're, of course, much more uh, knowledgeable about the narrative of people who are coming by foot over contiguous countries and borders. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the mechanisms by which people come up from overseas? To be honest, most West Africans, I would say, and this also applies to Central and East Africans, they are, or they have been at least in the past, especially what, ha what happened prior is they had visa-free abilities to get to some South American countries, in particular Brazil. That has since become a little bit more tentative and more difficult. Um, with this particular case, because of the conflict in Cameroon, which has been going on effectively since 2016, and the conflict is essentially, um, and I have to be careful with my wording here, uh, the conflict is essentially years and years and decades, and since perhaps since Cameroon attained their independence in 1961, um, of discrimination facing the English speaking populations of Cameroon. And it has gone on for, like I said, period of time. And in 2016, because of the, the protests of English speaking Cameroons against this discrimination, it resulted in um, a lot of violence by this enacted by the state. And I believe about half a million Cameroonians have since fled the country since about 2016. Mm. And so what happened in the case of my character, my main person, and you'll read it in this in story, maybe this month, maybe next month, who knows. Um, but we've all been there. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'll, I'll say her name, Juliana, is she was, you know, she is a woman who's 26. And so when this started happening, she was just 21 years old. And she, you know, she's not, uh, she's a working class person. She did hair and tailoring to make ends meet. And she ended up engaging in a business, what she thought was a, a business transaction that was taken as um, a political transaction. And so she ended up being taken by military personnel in the country. And it was a family member who ended up um, sort of bailing her out um, through, I would I would say that they were not exactly formal channels. And because of um, bailing her out, getting her out of the military's um, care, if you will, she fled to Equatorial Guinea. And from Equatorial Gu mm -hmm. Guinea, um, again, she sort of had to leave because there are a lot of people in Cameroon right now whose family they don't know where they are once they go to the capital city and are essentially captured by the military. And so she had the opportunity to leave um, through a lot of family help. And so she left to Equatorial Guinea, but Equatorial Guinea was also deporting Cameroonians back to the country. And so what she ended up doing is um, ended up attaining a flight to Brazil. Mm. And that flight to Brazil and you know, she doesn't, she speaks French and English, she doesn't speak Portuguese. And we're also talking about Bolsonaro's government that particularly has been anti-Black in a very specific ways. And that anti-Blackness is also extended to their migration policies. And there's, there are huge Haitian communities there that can speak to that. And so with Juliana in particular, she ended up deciding partially because some of the women that she ended up meeting in Brazil, and you know, this, the United States is painted as a city on a hill for a lot of people and for a lot of people out of the country, um, they sort of see it as a place where if they make it there, there will be sort of a respite and relief. And so she risked everything and ended up deciding that she would leave Brazil to try and make it to the United States. But she obviously did not take a flight 
she went through by bus, by foot, through the um, jungle, through crossing borders. And, you know, she, she, as she told me, she said, look, I just went with God. And that's, that's all you need to know. She's like, I went, I went with God. And throughout the course of her journey, she ends up um, sort of having a romantic partnership with a man from Haiti, which, you know, as I said, some of this part is, I do feel very lucky to have had the privilege of writing this story because her, with her partner being Haitian, it sort of ended up being like, okay, I can perfectly actually document the experience of a person from West Africa as well as a Haitian person coming through um, the continent, coming through the Americas to the Southern border and their dual experience. You can see there is a lot of gender at play, but there's also a lot of nationality at play. And what you have really, and this is sort of the argument that I'm making is that what you have really in these two people coming to the United States, you have a convolution of um, the history of French imperialism um, in terms of both Haiti and Cameroon. And then you also have the reality of the United States response to black migrants via the legacy of how they responded to Haiti in the revolution, which has always been from my perspective with contempt. And it sure. is, that, is that reality that um, has um, navigated Haitian American relations um, from the 1800s to present day, but it not only na affects Haitian nationals, it affects black migrants at large because what happened in the 1970s when Haitians were fleeing the Duvalier dynasty is that they're sort of, when the boat people, which is a pejorative that Haitians were referred to as, when they came um, via Florida usually, they were not met with the same um, level of support as you would say, for example, the Cuban migrants that were right. in Castro. Mm. And so what we actually end up seeing in my research is that if you look at what happened in the United States, both legally and culturally, the US response to black migrants is taken from how specifically, not only that legacy of enslavement and colonization and response to Haiti, but specifically Haitian migrants in the 1970s, the response was what created the detention systems that we have today that essentially meet a lot of people who are fleeing their homes and who are asylum seekers, which is what these folks are. Thank you. Um, Brittany, can you talk about your story, how you came to it? Yes, uh, first of all, Kobe, your story sounds crazy good. I'm so excited to read it. Um, and your book, you have so many cool things coming out. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so my story is about convict leasing in Texas. So I came across the story, um, I guess it was around July, 2018, um, which is a few months after a cemetery was discovered, um, uncovered really during construction of a new school in Sugarland, Texas. Um, 95 graves were uncovered there and it was kind of glossed over for a few months and then it was not really revealed that they were convict graves for a few more months. And then finally in January, the school district, which owned the land came out and said, okay, we think that these are convicts uh, who died here during the convict leasing era. And for me, that was the first time I'd ever heard of convict leasing, um, which knowing everything that I know now is terrible because it was such a formative part of not only making Sugarland Sugarland, but making Texas a state and making our country what it is today. And for me to have grown up in Texas my entire life, going to Texas universities, like, for me not to have ever heard of it is absurd. Um, so at the time I pitched it as a simple feature story to the Washington Post and my editor really liked it. Uh, they were saying, you know, if you think that one of your ancestors might be buried out here by any chance, you should contact us, the Texas Historic Commission. Um, and of course no one did. Uh, 
but naively, I thought that they might. And I said, oh my God, isn't this going to be such a good feature story when somebody comes through and we can talk about their family history and this journey for them and talk about convict leasing in this lovely featurey way. Um, but I kept following up months after months after months and nobody ever came forward. Um, and so eventually I just forgot about it. Washington Post moved on. Uh, we all moved on. Um, and then it was probably the beginning of 2021. Yes, that's the year we're in. Um, <laughs> that I was really burnt out working, um, covering COVID and covering the election and writing pretty much nonstop uh, during 2020. And it was all really heavy stuff. And I was just exhausted. And so I was like, maybe I should try something else for a while, maybe something that's not so writing heavy. <laughs> uh, and so I was like, ooh, making a podcast would be fun. Uh, and I thought maybe this would be a, a good opportunity to try something out and learn how to do editing and put everything together like that. Uh, and so I started trying to think of podcast ideas and very quickly this story popped back into my head and I was like, oh, what happened with that? And I looked and, you know, more research had been done in the years that elapsed between 2018 and now. And um, the school district had put out a report that included 71 names of people who might be buried there. And I was like, oh, you're giving me a list of 71 names. Like I can do something with those 71 names. And so I started putting together um, an outline of what I thought the story might be. And I started looking for people who might want to tell it with me because I knew that I could not do it alone, both logistically and just it wouldn't be very good if I was telling the story on my own. Um, and so I started looking for people who could support the narrative, who could speak to things I couldn't speak to, um, came up with a whole team. And then we started looking for funding and the Lipman Center was amazingly gracious, giving us our first um, grant, which really gave a lot of legitimacy to our project. And, uh, you know, now we are, we've been doing this since April, I think, full time. And it's so much better than I ever could have imagined it would be. Like the narrative has come together in such a way that is just a lot better than what I could have Im imagined when I first did that outline. And I no longer look at this as a way to <laughs> like so far past looking this is at this as a way to learn how to do audio editing or just get away from writing because by the way I haven't I'm still writing constantly so much work um but it's an incredible story and it it reaches across so many different topics and it's taught me to look at so much of our history with a completely different perspective um that it still astounds me that I didn't have before. And it's it's kind of, I don't know, I always say that it, I feel robbed that I didn't get to know this all growing up. Like think of all the years I've, <laughs> I've lost not having this information and like, why not? You know, it's part of our history. So key to Texas history that, mm -hmm. yeah, we definitely should have known it. I mean, it's fascinating you know, to, to see this story as a kind of tie um, you know, into the present, you know, because, you know, the convict lease system, you know, which was in Mississippi, you know, railroad workers and, and cotton um, plantations and, and draining swamps in Florida um, and Louisiana, you know, work that, uh, quite frankly, people did, um, you know, that they reserved for people who were convicts because they could work them to death and, you know, they, they wouldn't, have any financial loss uh, associated with it. You know, you just convict someone else and send them to replace the person who was dead. Uh, and so I wonder if you've, if you've had any kind of insight into the scale of looking at this in, in Sugarland specifically and has given you uh, insight into the scale of this in Texas. Oh yeah, it was, um, I've learned that convict leasing sort of, I don't think it's hyperbolic to say saved Texas. Um, after the Civil War, Texas was an agricultural centric economy. We only had agriculture. So when you, A, 
take away everybody's slaves. And of course, I'm looking at this from like the white landowners perspective, because mm -hmm. they're the ones who did it. Um, but when you take away everybody's slaves, A, you can't, you know, run your agricultural empire anymore. There's nobody to work the land. You're going to have to pay for that labor now. And B, your property valuation has decreased right. by like a million percent. Mm -hmm. um, they used to value uh, this county that I'm writing about right now, Freestone County, uh, two thirds of the entire valuation of the county was slaves. Mm -hmm. And so for mm -hmm. two thirds of your valuation to be completely gone all of a sudden, mm -hmm. not to mention the fact that like they were part of the Confederacy and Confederate money was now <laughs> useless and you know they were dealing with death and all the loss from war and just recovering like they were completely screwed as an economy and so you know it took some time to figure out how to set up the system but within two one to two years they had given out the first uh lease for convict labor and so it solved both of those problems it um, it gave you free, cheap labor force, and it allowed white landowners to continue to have a mechanism to oppress black people, which is what they really wanted to do. You know, that's the whole thing. Yeah, I, I think I think it's not an exaggeration to say that some of those counties never recovered from that loss. Um, you know, of the, that scale, they never reached the same sort of economic prominence that they had during slavery. Um, Shema, uh, good to see you, uh, you know, who you're the only person who, uh, here is a, wait, you, you are the only alum, only CJS alum on here, right? Okay. You know, I didn't want to, you know, make sure I hadn't missed anything with anyone. Um, and so it was good to see, uh, an alum here, a, a, a veteran who survived my class, <laughs> you know, um, can you talk? Uh, about your project and how you came to it. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, going after Kovie and Brittany, um, <laughs> I'm a little overwhelmed. Your projects are amazing. Um, and I can't wait to listen to them and, and read them. Um, so um, as Jelani mentioned, I'm a reporter at the Akron Beacon Journal where I cover um, Black communities. And I arrived here in um, June 2020 in the middle of um, civil rights protests. And in the course of learning about issues um, impacting uh, Black residents here, um, the Inner Belt Highway kept coming up as this, um, you know, very painful um, um, reminder of um, the current economic state of um, Black Akronites. Um, and uh, th that particular highway, um, it tore apart uh, Black neighborhoods and displaced about 3,000 households in, in Akron. Um, which is 82% of them were black. Um, and uh, this happened in the 60s and early 70s um, at the same time that, you know, we saw, we saw this happening throughout the country. And so um, uh, in the course of talking to people, you know, I kept hearing about just, um, you know, the loss of community as a result of people's neighborhoods being torn up um, and their loved ones being displaced. Um, I learned a little bit about the environmental harms caused by living next to a highway. And um, what I thought was um, really, really important, um, was well, especially interesting is um, how that experience can tell us about um, what Black people in Akron are experiencing in terms of, you know, lower home ownership rates um, and inability to generate, uh, to, to, to accumulate generational wealth. Um, and so um, I sort of, you know, part of this is, you know, a project um, that's dealing with a pretty complicated history. And so part of the issue, uh, the difficulty was to find people who had experienced displacement, whose, whose families had experienced displacement, while also talking to people who were, um, uh, who stayed for, you know, a variety of reasons, either um, the city you know, uh, did not offer them money um, for their homes. And so they had to stay and deal with plummeting property values. Um, and so in order to start that process, um, I started um, visiting, um, you know, uh, senior uh, homes in particular neighborhoods. Um, I reached out to 
um, religious leaders in the Black community um, here in Akron. And um, I interviewed some local historians. And um, another, you know, I guess another reason why the project felt important um, is because um, that stretch of that highway um, never really lived up to its promise. It was never completed. Um, and uh, it was really underused. It was supposed to hold um, 120 you know, vehicles a day. It only held um, only about like 18,000. It had a lot of, um, it had a pretty high crash rate. And since 2017, the Ohio Department of Transportation began decommissioning a 30 um, acre portion of it. And so since then, there have been some discussions about what to do with that land. And um, so I became interested in, you know, okay, who's having those conversations? Who's invited to the table? Um, and we know just from, you know, talking to people and, um, you know, digging through archives, reading old um, newspaper articles that um, the residents whose, whose lives were affected were absolutely not part of the conversation. Um, and so I thought this would be an opportunity to um, really show uh, how this continues of the lingering pain um, of this experience and, um, you know, maybe what we could do uh, better this time. Mm. I wonder if there, uh, like how much you've seen of the ancillary, um, and I don't want to say that dismissively, um, but the ancillary effects of, you know, this displacement and this creation of this highway, you know, does that pop up in other things that you cover? Um, and, you know, is there kind of a multifaceted set of legacies that this public planning policy um, decision had? Yeah, yeah. And actually, um, so one of the one of the issues I was looking into, um, and and you know, it's 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 an issue that I want to continue exploring. I think this was kind of the first the first part of the project, really understanding, you know, what the inner belt did. Um, but I, um, you know, had mapped out, um, uh, you know, gun violence in Akron over the last 10 years and um, noticed clusters of, um, noticed clusters of, you know, unsolved homicides in very specific, you know, neighborhoods, not even neighborhoods, like, you know, a four block radius. And so, um, a lot of, you know, I, I want to be really careful because I, you know, um, not at all insinuating that, you know, um, just because you live in um, a neighborhood that's impoverished that, you know, um, you will commit crimes. That's not at all, you know, what I'm saying. Um, but we do know that like those lower, lower income neighborhoods where there, you know, there's lots of school closures. Um, there, there were multiple schools that just don't exist there anymore. Um, that also contributes to low property values. Um, we know that there are high gun violence rates there. Um, you know, these areas are food deserts. So it just has like a host of, um, of implications and impacts. And, 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 you know, part of the area that was cut through was also like a very vibrant um, black business corridor and and that's gone too um so i hope that answers your question no it does um can you all talk to me a little bit about the particular obstacles that you've encountered in reporting out your stories and we'll go in the reverse order this time so we'll stop so we we'll start with shama okay all right um Brittany being in the middle still in the middle <laughs> Yeah, there were a lot of um, obstacles. So one was finding people who could speak to this history. Um, and so, you know, I think talking to advocates and religious leaders who know this community much better than I do. I've only been here since 2020, um, most of, you know, also during a pandemic. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I think that was difficult. And I think also one of the themes that kind of kept emerging for me was, um, like a lot of a lot of the people who are, who can talk about this, they were children at the time, right? And they also didn't have um, necessarily the language to understand what was happening. It was happening very fast. Um, this is before you know, um, you know. I think the press started maybe even covering these issues um, in in a more you know honest way. Um, and so, you know, I think I think. As a reporter, I had to think a lot about 
um, trauma informed interview techniques. Um, I think, you know, the other, another, another challenge that I faced was that, um, you know, the, the city administration, um, I, I learned through a source that, um, that they had formed this informal um, advisory committee to um, advise the mayor, present some recommendations on what to do with this stretch of land. And um, one of the committee members um, was directly impacted by the construction of the highway. So I think, um, you know, he mentioned it to me and I think I wasn't supposed to know. Uh, and so um, it's been a bit of a battle. Um, I don't have access to those meetings. Um, they've been happening uh, once a month for a few months. Um, they're not subject to public meeting laws because they're, you know, it's an informal um, committee, but, um, you know, I do know that uh, they're launching, the city is now launching a public engagement period um, starting sometime in the winter um, to, to get more um, input from um, residents. Um, and then also just, you know, um, dealing, you know, going through archives. Um, I'm, a, I'm an early career reporter. And so, um, you know, I think this was my, you know, first time like really sitting down at the University of Akron and, and digging through relocation records to try to understand what, you know, what people um, went through. Um, and, you know, another portion of this project is um, looking at data, like trying to collect data on, um, on property values over time. And so that's been, um, you know, just to get a sense of, you know, what, what, a particular home is um, how much how much a home is worth in some of these neighborhoods versus you know a comparably sized you know condition house um, in another part of Akron and, and why is that um, so th those are those are some of the challenges that I faced. Mm. And Brittany, yeah. So some of mine are well, what, really, like, a quick reminder for people: you can you start putting your question the Q into the Q and A. Uh, so we can have those loaded up and when we have uh, time to get to them. Okay, Brittany. Yeah, uh, some of the challenges are kind of the same ones I face with every story I do. Um, finding funding was really um, like a long process. Uh, the Littman Center gave us our first uh, grant, but it was $10,000, which we were enormously thankful for, but we had a team of five people. So we knew we needed more. Um, and actually the Littman Center gave us more. So we were eternally grateful for that too. But uh, before we knew that we were, you know, I've never had to, to look for funding on that scale before um, or funding like this before. Um, I've, I've also never led a team of you know, five other people before. So it was a lot of new stuff. Um, but just like the logistics of finding the money, um, finding people who thought your story was good, pitching the story, finding somebody who wants to partner with us. That's all really hard still. Um, and writing is difficult. It's an eight episode podcast. And that means I'm writing like eight long form magazine articles. Um, it's so much work and I'm not even close to done, um, but it's happening. Um, so that's all basic stuff, but also, you know, I had to, um, I've had to, like Shama said, go through archives. Um, I've done some of that before, but not on this scale. And this is all stuff that took place like a hundred years ago. Um, and it's all paper archives for the most part. So I had to go across the state a bunch of different times to dig up stuff. And it's stuff that only exists um, in those places physically. And, you know, we've got a map maker that's making maps that have never existed before mm. based on like references and stuff. Like it's, it's a lot of very cool research stuff, but it's stuff that I've had to learn. I've also had to learn how to do gene genealogy research for the first time. Um, and also like, about that actually yeah mm -hmm. oh yeah it's it's really fun um but it is a time suck for sure i've sure. spent like days weeks um on certain families only to be like eh, i can't find anything and have to move on it's terrible um but also like shama said i'm having the records fight of my life 
with the school district, which owns the cemetery, um, they tried to charge, they gave us a cost estimate of $15 million. What? Yeah. For uh, records? For the most basic <clears throat> records request I have like ever submitted. It was two keyword searches on like 30 inboxes. Should have taken five seconds to process. It should have been completely free. And no, $15 million. <laughs> so it's just been months and months and months of back and forth with them. We have the help of SMU's um, First Amendment Clinic. They're being our lawyers for free, which is very kind of them, um, fighting with those people. At the school district, they've since brought the estimate down quite a bit, but it's just been a constant, there's no reasonable reason for them to cost any money at all. Um, it's just, they're trying to keep it from us. Um, so. Now prior <laughs> prior to this, I, I was gonna say that my most outrageous experience with an archive um, happened when I was in Moscow <laughs> and I was uh, doing research at the Lenin archive, which is you know, a very particular kind of place, you know, anyway. Uh, and, you know, I found these documents that I thought were interesting and I, you know, went up and requested that they be copied and, you know, it goes through all the channels and uh, sure. And I said, they, I, I said, but I'm going back to the United States, you know, can I have these mailed to me in the United States? Sure, no problem. But you always have to be careful when things are too easy in Moscow, mm -hmm. because while they could mail them to me in the United States, and they said that it would only take a week or so for them to get to me in the United States. It would take them six months to get around to actually copying the documents for me. And so prior to this, but they didn't charge me $15 million. I think that that was even more outrageous uh, than, than uh, my experience in Russia was. Yeah, no one I've talked to has ever received an estimate that big. And when they hear what it's for, it's like, that's just crazy. That's just insane. Yeah, um, I think like that's uh, when a, a lawyer reaches out. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they did. And that was after the lawyer was involved because wow. their first estimate was like $50,000. And I was like, well, that's crazy. And then they came back and they were like, actually, after you narrowed your request, we found out it's actually going to be $15 million. It's like, how did you even do that? <laughs> right. <laughs> what well, are you even talking about? Yeah. So that's been fun, too. <laughs> uh, and uh, Kovier? I think um, with these sorts of immigration, migration, asylum seeker, refugee sorts of stories, the challenge is getting people to trust you enough to tell you your story, mm. because there is just a sense that a lot of people have. They have a credible fear that if they speak to you, that the government will see that as a way for them to be deported back to their countries. And so, you know, while I have these two characters that I do focus on, I also interview and reported on other people who have been in the same situation. And this is sort of a dual challenge because of the spotlight of what happened in Del Rio, which I traveled to, um, to speak with uh, Haitians in September. You know, I was planning on going to Texas, um, because that is, I really wanted to be at the border and see what the conditions were like for black migrants then. But the week before I was planning to go to Texas is when Del Rio happened. And so I ended up including Del Rio as part of my um, city tour in Texas to see what was happening to migrants. And it's sort of the same thing. You have that fear of like, if I speak to this person, what will happen to mm. my asylum case? So mm. that is something I was always very cognizant about. I was very lucky in the fact that my two main characters were, you know, they trust me enough to give me both their names and identifying information. And I think that also um, sort of happened because of the connections I had made with um, particular immigration lawyers before, and they understood that okay, like I'm a journalist, I have to do my job, but I'm actually going to treat this person with care. And I think that that is important, but also you sort of have to, as a journalist, go back and forth between, I cannot, you know, as a human being, I want to 
ensure that I'm not overstepping my bounds. But as a journalist, sometimes I have to overstep my bounds, right. which, is, which is sort of a negotiation that you're making throughout the interview. And Juliana specifically, she has been through all sorts of horrors, both on the journey as well as in Cameroon itself. So there is that matter. I think there's also the matter of migration stories, immigration stories, incidents like what happened in Del Rio, in Texas, with um, Haitians arriving at the border in those large numbers. Um, when that happened, I sort of had a fear that the news would sort of go in up in that story and then go out, which tends to happen a lot in our media cycle, just because of attention span, really. And then it would become a sort of like insignificant moment to people who are paying attention to what is happening in the country, especially at the border. And so I think that there, there was a bit of that fear and that challenge of like, okay, nobody is going to care about this big story once this incident has taken place and everybody has been outraged by it. Um, what, what more is there to say about it? Meanwhile, there's a lot more to say about it. And I do sort of make that connection in my work between this massive incident that took place and how it's also ultimately connected to the realities of what black migrants like my main characters have faced throughout. Um, there's the challenge of actually visiting the border towns, you know, um, Reynosa um, on the Mexico side and sort of um, having to address and deal with the reality that even um, a situation in which they're, these are migrants who have all fled their country. There is still amongst those migrants a racial hierarchy with black migrants being at the bottom. And that is very surreal to sort of feel the presence of that when you're in a, a migrant camp at the border. And mm -hmm. so that was sort of like challenging to navigate as well as like, how do I document that reality um, while also you know, being true to the fact that all of these um, migrants are ultimately facing um, a policy and a um, legal system and a history that discriminates against all of them. And yet, even amongst them, <laughs> you are dealing with the problem of racial hierarchy. So is this a, a, a dynamic that plays out among the groups of migrants um, themselves, or is this something that people are cognizant of? Or I, know this more about how the system regards people? It's both, to be quite honest, because um, one of the cities I traveled to was also El Paso. And I met with a Haitian pastor there who is um, sort of a Haitian American pastor, I should say, who has received a lot of Haitians arriving. And he sort of, he sort of documented and talked about how, um, from his observations, Black migrants were treated worse. They would just be left sometimes at the airports, at bus stations, without um, the US system really giving them any kind of idea of what they needed to do in order to wait before the asylum case is called up. They're not giving really any resources. It's sort of like being dumped in a foreign country. You don't really speak the language, you're taken in. And sure, they say that your asylum case is uh, something that they can adjudicate on. And so they're waiting, but you're not really given any, you're not really given any resources on how to take care of yourself. You're sort of like left. So he would literally pick up Haitians at the airport who had, who had been at the airport for days because they had no idea. And he saw that that was a different experience from some of the Spanish speaking migrants from the Americas who were sort of pointed out to particular um, organizations and were sometimes driven to those organizations to meet with caretakers who would receive them. So there is that reality of like the system just deprioritizing help specifically for black migrants. And then within the camps themselves, I was at a camp in Reynosa and I was with um, somebody who runs what she calls sidewalk schools. And it's essentially for school, school education, books, things like that for um, asylum seekers and their children. 
and it's actually mostly directed at children I should say and as I was taking a tour of the campus I was like um why don't I see any um Haitians in the kitchens and she's like oh um the Spanish-speaking migrants don't let them go in the kitchen and I was just like I don't understand and so I had to sort of like take that in and we got into a discussion she's like there is racism within this migrant camp (laughs) that's how it operates they don't allow them to go in the kitchen and because they're um, specifically at least in that period they were the dominant migrants there Um, it's not like the Haitians could put up a resistance there so they sort of had to sort of get help from whoever was willing to give it to them and in just in that migrant camp in general it just made very clear that in in any circumstance the racial hierarchy is going to be present. So that was that was sort of challenging to address in the piece as well. That's astounding. Um, Shema, there's a question in the chat that says, highway systems throughout the empire have been used to destroy black communities. Have you found how, why they are so consistent in their impacts? And then some examples after that, but I think we can start with that question. Sure, yeah. Um, I read that question and, um, you know, this happened, what happened in Akron um, is obviously not unique to Akron. It happened in many major cities. Um, It's actually currently, there are plans to build another um, highway in South Carolina right now, actually, um, that would displace uh, Black residents as well. So, um, you know, in, I, I can, I can tell you that, you know, in Akron, well, it's a little bit complicated because there's some speculation just from talking to community members um, about the timing of um, of the highway construction. Um, Akron experienced civil unrest in '68, and um, some residents of those neighborhoods, you know, feel that this was a way this breaking apart of these communities was. Um, was like a sort of punishment for that. And, you know, the 1969 Akron Commission on Civil Disorders, um, I'm just gonna quote a a piece of that. Um, It says, you know, one of the root causes of the civil disorders in July, 1968 was the aggravated compression of black people into Akron ghettos, primarily as a consequence of the urban renewal programs in the Grant Washington area um, and the downtown area. Um, I thought that was really interesting. um, you know, I know that for the for the particular for this highway, um, it was um, meant to connect downtown Akron to uh, suburbs, and um, people I've spoken to, you know, will say um, it was it was designed such that people from the suburbs wouldn't have to set foot in black neighborhoods right. in order to do their shopping. Um, and you know, what's also interesting is that uh, there's a uh, an affluent white community. Um, uh, it's called Fairlawn, and um, they resisted, they protested, and ultimately won. Um, um, they resisted the, the uh, construction of a highway that would have cut through their community. Um, so if you look at it on a map, it kind of, rather than continuing up north, it kind of circle, it goes westward and kind of just goes around the neighborhood. Um, so yeah, I mean, Akron received federal funds. Um, um, like many other places, it was a combination of federal, state, and local funds. And, uh, um, you know, I think also it raises a lot of questions about value. These, these areas where Black people lived were redlined, right? And so they were carved out for, you know, for that reason as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's kind of, that's mm. what I thought. <laughs> Brittany, can you talk, this will have to be our last question because of time. Can you talk about um, to the extent I don't want you to put too fine a point on it um, or to send you in a direction that you, you know, maybe your research hasn't suggested, but do you find any ties between what you're studying in this criminal justice system of Sugarland, uh, Texas, a hundred years ago uh, and the contemporary criminal justice landscape in Texas? Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a strong connection. Um, Texas went from this basically where they were leasing out all their convicts and that's how they were making all their money is to lease them out to private farmers, railroads, all that stuff. They immediately transitioned from that when they saw, oh, that's broken. They still let it happen for like 50, 60 years, but they saw that it was bad. When they finally transitioned out of it, 
they didn't actually change anything. They just, the state bought the farms. And so they just started farming them themselves. So it was the same. They just cut out the middleman. They just mm. cut out the private farmers. Mm. Um, and in theory, that was supposed to make it like a little safer or whatever. Um, did it? I don't know. But, you know, as we moved away from agriculture as an economy and got into more diverse industries, um, our prison labor just diversified. And this happened across the country. But in Texas, I mean, we bring in, I think the most recent figure was 2019. And I think it was 79 or $80 million a year just on prison made goods and labor. I mean, it's not a small amount. And Texas prisons are massive. So that doesn't even cover all of our costs, but it takes a chunk out. Like it goes a long way. Um, and while the dynamic has changed a bit, like black lives are no longer given the same value as they once were, like literally value, you know, like farmers would ask for 200 black men, um, to work the fields. Cause they were like, they're better than 200 white men or 200 Mexican men or whatever. Um, so they were valued really highly, like economically speaking. Um, that's no longer necessarily true, but I think the racial aspect of bringing black men into the criminal justice system is maybe still true in a lot of ways. Like, you know, you remember it solved two problems, one economic and one, you know, racist. It doesn't really do this one anymore to the extent that like black lives are more valuable, quote unquote, than other people. They just need bodies to do labor. Um, but it still succeeds in oppressing the black population because if you are arresting more black people, then there are more black people in jail. It keeps this population down. It just keeps their foot on them. And so, yeah, you can still see that impact. And yeah, so prison labor is still very around today, real big in Texas. And um, we don't pay our prisoners anything, I should say that. Uh, most states do pay them something. It's not much, it's like 30, 80 cents a day. Um, I think California pays something like $3 or $4, some, something way higher. Um, but Texas is one of either three or five states that pays absolutely nothing. And we have the most prisoners, so. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, these are all clearly very um, sobering and very compelling and very important stories. And, you know, the Litman Center uh, is honored to have you three working uh, on these stories. Uh, and we're excited to see, you know, them come uh, forth into existence and uh, hopefully, the, you know, some change uh, that is sparked uh, by the work that you all are doing. Uh, we're at our time limit, and so I want to say thank you, um, and uh, thank you to our audience of people who have um, come to this rescheduled uh, forum that we've had here, uh, and uh, have a good night. Thank, thank you, you so much, Jelani. Thank you, Brittany, and Shema, and the audience. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye.